Um, and before you give me too much crap about that, yes, it really is that bad. Internet Explorer is like a major source of um, pain for us. And it implements so many things so differently that um, it just takes us lots and lots of time. Yes. Um, this yeah. this we, comment is actually on the web somewhere. And we, we have like two engineers that work full time um, just dealing with these types, types of problems. And they spend more than half their time in Internet Explorer, even though Internet Explorer for us is something like 5% or 6% uh, of use. Uh, and for, for, for the whole web, it's somewhere in the low 20s or teens. So yeah. it, it's, it's a disproportionate culprit of ma major issues constantly. So the other thing that we want um, is real-time collaborative editing, where multiple people can edit documents and see each other changes in real time. And that exists in the open source world. Um, Etherpad Lights and a few other things are very good open source tools that do collaborative editing. And um, in the non-open source world, things like Google Docs do collaborative editing less well than this, but still acceptably well. But the thing is, the state of the art in open source collaborative editing is stuff like this. This was the main page of Etherpad Lite yesterday, and it sort of speaks to what people do. Um, the content that you can insert is very basic. They're, the structure that you can do is very basic. And we've been to their conferences. We know what this stuff looks like on the inside. It's not really structure at all. The lists are built with asterisk characters that are annotated with the depth of the list. It's horrible. So what we want is to have an editor that can do collaboration on like deep structure, on real documents that you want, actually want to edit. And so that we don't have yet. We will be working on that soon. Um, right now, um, we are working on a project called Visual Editor. Um, we work for the Wikimedia Foundation. We work on MediaWiki, which is the software uh, that runs Wikipedia. And if you're not confused already, yes, we hate the people that came up with those names too. Um, we are building Visual Editor mainly to edit um, pages on Wikipedia. Um, but despite that, we're building it in the modular way. And we want it to be an editor for HTML in general. We want it to be an editor for the web, not just for wikis. And so we want it to generally fill the gap of rich contribution on the web. And so content on Wikipedia is supposed to generally be pretty simple. This is Wikitext. It's the markup language that Wikipedia uses. And it looks fairly like unintimidating. There's like, you know, there's asterisk for lists, and there's bracket for links, and then the little quotes are bold text. And it's, this looks fairly reasonable, right? This is like, it's kind of like markdown. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, however, you can also do very complex things in Wikitext, and it's basically a programming language. Um, this is a particular template that um, works around the lack of string operations and the lack of iteration in Wikitext to compute the length of a string um, by trying to pad it to different lengths and see if it changes. And this particular bit computes the middle digit of the length by doing linear search from 0 to 30 and then binary search between 40 and 90. And it's all unrolled because there's no loop, so this is a big nested if else statement, and this is only about a quarter of it. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? It's brain <laughs> it will look better if you compile it into brain fuck, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and this isn't really that isolated of a case. Yeah, like, I, I, this is actually how tons and tons of the content on Wikipedia is created. More of it's generated than most people think. And this creates a problem because what we were talking about before with parameterized content, you can't directly edit that stuff. But what's worse is that this is not like a clean function call with simple values as parameters. This is uh, this like crazy generated uh, preprocessor that takes multiple passes, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, preprocessor is the best way to look at it. And so this has since been replaced because we now allow Lua to be used in Wikitext. So you can write these things in, actual, in an actual programming language now that makes a lot of things a lot cleaner. But this is sort of the worst Wikitext that exists. And the previous slide was sort of the best that exists. Um, I think that we dropped the slides where we show you what the source code for like the San Francisco article looks like. And it's, about, it's somewhere in between these two, but it's still fairly intimidating. We might actually show it in the demo. And so we did, um, we did user research. We did user testing. We had a bunch of people sit down and like monitor them with cameras and through like a see-through mirror and all that kind of stuff. And so we did this in a lab. So all the engineers and designers were watching these people. And it was very, very frustrating to watch them because they were very, very frustrated trying to do the tasks we gave them. And 
we were, just, we were asking them to do really basic things like, can you add a link or can you just fix a typo? And uh, they found this stuff to be really, really hard. And at the end of uh, a, a whole bunch of these studies, we basically came to a firm conclusion that the only way we were ever going to be able to increase the number of people that would be able to contribute to Wikipedia was to break down this technological barrier that people had uh, been coming up against and have a, like a WYSIWYG editor. And um, about the same time, Wikia was working on this same problem. They uh, used the same software as us, but for very different reasons, uh, or at least different purposes. Uh, and they, they make wikis for mostly entertainment type topics, stuff that doesn't really have a home on an encyclopedia. But they are community-run wikis nonetheless, so they, they have a lot of similarities, and they use the same software. So they, they also had this problem because most of their uh, users were not very sophisticated either. So they came up with an editor that basically takes whatever the rendered version of the page was and then lets people edit it using that content editable horribleness that we talked about earlier. And then whatever kind of state it was in after they were done editing it, they'd send it back to the server and then try and convert it back to Wikitext. Uh, and this, in really simple cases, kind of seemed like this is possible, you know, a heading turns into this and a paragraph turns into that, but uh, with, with any sufficient complexity, it, it really falls apart. You can see that this, this page, which is supposed to be about the Batmobile, uh, there's that little green icon on the top. That is uh, like a template. That's, so that's a bit of generated content. Now, they weren't able to make it so the, they could render that in the editor. So they just show every single little bit of generated content as little puzzle pieces. So if you came here to edit whatever you saw in there, you're out of luck. Uh, at least you have no idea that that's where it went. And, um, this, and this is actually a very simple page. Um, in in sl even slightly more complex pages, the editor just gives up and we just go back to Wikitext for the whole page. And this kind of makes it so the, having the visual editor uh, doesn't really help you at all. So, uh, and, and so the, 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 we, the WYSIWYG editor actually works reasonably well for new wikis that they start, and they start new wikis all the time. Like, like Game of Thrones wiki was only started a couple years ago for obvious reasons. And um, for those, if you start building everything with the visual editor, then, or with the WYSIWYG editor, then of course it works, because what it spits out, it can also take back in. So for new wikis, it actually works reasonably well, but if you're having to deal with legacy content, the whole thing just falls apart. Yeah, and what, what happens is like these bigger wikis, sometimes even more established wikis, as, the, as they start a lot, you know, as people start adding templates that do crazy things, everything starts falling apart, and in most pages, the visual editor was disabled on large wikis, uh, especially the, the more mature ones. And so, again, like we really needed to figure out a way to allow people to edit the portions of the page that are reasonable to edit, but be able to just block off, still render, but block off the bits that maybe aren't quite safe. Whether we're not compatible with that yet, or it happens to be generated, or, or whatever. For whatever reason, we needed to have like a progressive enhancement approach. And, um, and then also, you know, just to be able to render it as similarly to the view as possible. And so the main problem in this general project is that the Wikitext parser isn't really a parser in the traditional sense or in any sense. It takes, like Wikitext goes in and HTML comes out. This but isn't real code, by the way. Yeah, this is, is not a actual code, of course. Um, Wikitext goes in, HTML comes out, but what happens in between is sort of magical. And it, like, it doesn't really build an abstract syntax tree or any of that. So it just takes... It takes the wiki text, it throws a bunch of regular expressions on it and just like grinds on it until it mostly starts looking like HTML. Then it runs it through an external library called HTML tidy that like fixes all the sort of messes that we made and like this, the HTML syntax areas that exist. And um, then that's what we return. And so for a lot of things, like I think headers and links are sort of exceptions, but for a lot of things we never build a syntax tree. We build a tree of the headers that exist by literally doing a regex replacement from like numbers of e number of equal signs, text number of equal signs to an H something tag with a callback that also registers in a data structure. But that's horrible because after that you have what's still mostly weak text except the headers are now H tags. And so then you go and replace another thing. And so the, the tech, it like sort of works in the string that slowly goes from being weak text to being HTML. 
and at no point is it actually like fully, I think the preprocessor does actually fully, is actually a proper parser now, the one that does the curly brace expansion stuff. The but macro stuff. The macro stuff is like a proper preprocessor, but everything that happens after that is just sort of like regexes. And, and, and because yeah. Wikitext allows you to use some HTML, some Wikitext, and these macros, uh, you can have a heading that was created using actual H tags or a heading that was used, that used like these equal signs we use as markup. And they produce the same output. Yeah, they produce the same output, which is ambiguous. So you have to hack all this stuff into, a, into the parser. This is what Wikia had to do. They had to hack all this stuff into the parser to leave little breadcrumbs to say, hey, by the way, this came from there, this came from there. And uh, it, I, I guess like what he was trying to des describe was how, since we never really have a full concept of the document, there's a limit to how much context you can build into the output. And so for, to actually be able to go from HTML back to Wikitext, we, um, had to, we, built, we ended up building, or a, a team that is closely related to us ended up building a new parser for Wikitext that actually um, outputs reasonable output in a more predictable way using a peg grammar. Um, that, and with the output, ha the output has um, additional data that's in data attributes that are not shown here in the slide that um, give us additional information that we can use to trip it back to Wikitext because we need to use, like, which one of the five ambiguous syntaxes that could have produced this did they use, right? We don't know, so put in a data attribute. And so um, it is able to take new things that the editor created and um, turn them into some sort of default representation of Wikitext so it doesn't rely on the data attributes, but they're there to, um, to not, like, normalize everything all over and the And we place. can build a full set of them because we actually have a full parse tree. Yeah. So, um, the Parsoid team is doing their own sort of, is there, this project is like, it's one slide in our presentation. It is deserving of a presentation in itself. These guys are doing rocket science. Um, they are awesome. Um, as far as we're concerned, what we're doing is we're taking their HTML that they produce from Wikitext. We're loading it into our HTML editor. We're letting the user edit it. And then when they're done, we give the HTML back to them and they turn it into Wikitext again. And they've gotten really good at doing that with very clean Wiki text diffs, basically only changing what the user actually changed in our DOM. And I think they're at, you know, high 90 percentile of Wiki, uh, Wikipedia content uh, that they can cleanly run trip with no issues. Yeah, and like the, 98? That, yeah, that last little bit is the most offensive uses uh, and abuses of every bug and quirk in our system. And so that's kind of a long tail that we're going to have to chase down. And so people have actually tried to do this before, like people uh, have previously worked on projects, mostly in, in an academic setting, where they tried to build a parser with Wikitext, and all have failed, mostly because the starting point ends up being like, okay, let's figure out what the grammar is. Let's write, like, a Bison grammar for this or whatever. And that doesn't work at all, because Wikitext really isn't a designed language, or it's not really a well-designed language, and so it doesn't actually, like, it's not even a... a it's not a regular grammar. It's not There's a regular grammar. It's not a context-free grammar. It's not a context-sensitive yes, grammar. It's not a context-free or sensitive grammar. So it, like, it doesn't follow any, sort of any, any of the rules that normal programming language follow to make them easy to parse. And we ended up using a, a peg grammar because it allows us to basically put a function in as the, as the way that we resolve a certain, a certain piece of code. Yeah. It allows you to randomly deviate from the grammar where you need to, which is basically how you need to deal with Wikitext because it's horrible. Uh, no, that is in Node.js, actually. Yeah. The, the, this, pro this parser project was written in Node.js. So what if the team chased down those last couple percent? So, I, I would say that there's two different ways that we're doing it. One is adding support for the crazy use case that uh, we don't have support yet for. And the other is saying, this is only used on four articles. Let's just go fix those four articles and get on with our life. So uh, yeah, we haven't done a lot of the latter yet. I think that's our last resort because um, the problem the problem with doing that is that every single Wikipedia article has a full history of every single change that's ever been made, and uh, that we think that that's a really useful feature. And if you go and change it just to make it compatible with the new system, then it makes it's kind of like a block. You can't go past that, and so uh, that's going to be something that we're going to do with great thought and consideration. But It's, that's probably what we'll have to look at doing, yeah, and kind of amend all of those commits, yeah. if you will. Uh, yeah. 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 Probably. Because you yeah. have to rewrite history. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they write a lot of bots that detect the use of certain anomalies and weirdness and craziness, uh, and uh, they're just constantly grinding like their tests against content to see yeah. where they're where they're falling. But mostly, it's. Chasing it down, uh, ideally, is adding support for these 
crazy things. Like, uh, I'll just give you one example, is that a template, which is essentially a function call, you give it a, a name of like what template you're going to use, and you pass it a variety of parameters. But you can also, instead of just giving a plain value as a parameter, you can provide a template as a parameter, and it will resolve that template and then use its result as a, as a value. And that seems really useful. Um, unfortunately, the way it's been implemented is that you can have a template that um, provides more than one parameter. If its output uh, outputs the delimiter of what we use for delimiting the parameters, then it can produce all of the parameters or none. And um, this, is, this is where we don't even have a sane correlation of like parameter and you know, the, the wiki text that went into it because it's just this preprocessor like we said and it just keeps expanding, expanding, expanding so until something makes sense. I'm not sure that you can expand, though. There's a limit to what you can generate. I'm not sure that you can generate pipes anymore, although you may be able to. You, I'm pretty sure you can't generate closing braces. There, there is some sort of limit where it parses things first and then generates and then parses We've run them, into situations where there aren't enough limits. And, uh, yeah. and what we kind of see is like it's a little bit too late to get the toothpaste back in the tube. Like it's not, gonna, it's not all going to go back in. Like we've got to figure out ways to support this stuff. And you know, maybe let the community know, please stop doing this, and maybe even go and fix some of it for them. But uh, like I said, the corpus has this history to yeah. it. Yeah, you got to realize too, there's like 20 million race. pages that are like 10 years old. There's yeah. every almost we have actually found some, found some edge cases that no one knew about that we discovered and that no one was using, which is very rare because people discover these edge cases and they use them and they use them all over the place. If Exploit you have, them. Yeah, but if you have 20 million articles, like you are going to find every edge case somewhere in your corpus, is the general expectation. So um, we are building something, not just talking about the fact that we want to build something. Uh, and Shall I drive for a bit? I'm going to let Roan drive. Um, yeah, the touchpad is dead, remember? There you go. So if you are logged into Wikipedia and you turn on a preference, you can use the product that we're talking about. And in about two weeks, Everyone will be able to use it, even anonymous users. Uh, we are like right up against a really big release for our project right now, and we're going there default go. on English Wikipedia and many other wikis. So it's enable visual enhance. Enable visual editor. This is the one. Okay. So um, in this, like I said, this will be default uh, with, within a couple of weeks. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to play with it, that's how you do it. Um, go to like a random page. You're logged in as me, so yeah. careful what you edit. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Denmark and the Eurovision Song Contest having one. I love okay. Wikipedia. And so we have it turned on. It for now, it's edit and edit source. That may change. But essentially, we've taken over the edit tab. And this is what it looks like when you fire it up. And you can now edit this document pretty much directly just the way it was. So um, I'll just talk about some of the things that, that this does while he's playing with it. So like, like we said, this is actually an HTML editor. There are some wiki-specific things that we've built into it, but they're all just extensions. There's a core of uh, this product called Visual Editor, which is an open source project uh, that is completely standalone. You don't have to use MediaWiki to use it. And we licensed it at MIT. We're hoping that people will be able to integrate it in, in everything. And uh, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of our main objectives of coming here and, and getting people to know about what's going on. Um, but anyways, you can just edit HTML documents. And since Parsoid, which is what we showed you before, can generate these HTML documents, we're just editing this all as just plain old HTML with, uh, with some extra extensions. And the extra extensions is an important point because um, just an HTML editor isn't really what you need. What you need is something that's HTML plus stuff. Because like WordPress has this concept of short codes, which are little bits of generated content. And that's not plain old HTML. So what we need is, is to be able to have an editor that you can say, oh, but if you encounter this, then go fetch the information from there. And these are the parameters and, and all that. So this editor understands that some things are generated and, and parametric and uh, allows so you to edit those things. So I can't, so there Temple, is, it's template editing so isn't this box, live yet. It won't lay, it lo, oh, actually it is on this one, apparently. Um, so it won't let me, oh, okay. oh, here we go. Here's the thing. There is a bug where that one so, sometimes doesn't show up as the first template. <laughs> this is a live demo, so. Yeah. 
Um, so there is a, oh, I think it might just be broken. Maybe this throws an exception. I you can know. show that on the, um, on the, in the, in the, on the hello yeah. generator. It's like the tab in the middle. Um, Does this one work? No, no. it also doesn't go, work. Go, to, have the, a, go yeah. to the other tab, hello generated content. Yeah, here we go. So this is running a slightly more um, up-to-date version. So what this, what this is doing here is that there's a start, a row, and an end template. Now this is really common and horrible in Wikipedia. What people do is they have a table and some headings. If you've ever seen like television show listings on Wikipedia, they, this is really common there too. So there's like kind of a standard format for how to, how to start a television show listing table. And then they'll have a bunch of templates that generate rows of maybe varied styles or whatever. And then they'll have another template that ends it. So yeah. these are all three separate things. And there's no way when you're parsing to quite know that they're supposed to be related. So what we do is we, we just look at their output and we see that um, you have to go all the way to the end one before it closes the table. And then we associate them all as a, a group, a cluster of generated content and perhaps there's even some plain content in between. And then we allow you to edit it as a series of templates. Um, and you can also add a bit of content in between if you want. And it'll just add raw wiki texts in between. So this is a very generic utility for editing these things that are basically series, a, a series of transclusions, as we call it, basically including content from somewhere else or template calls. And uh, you can edit the parameters. So, th so this is also going to be going live in at least, or it's supposed to be live already, but it's not, not working properly. So yeah. Another thing we have is the, the thing where it says the greatest template in the history of the world. Um, that is a template documentation that is actually pulled from the template page. So templates have informal documentation, but they don't really have structured documentation right now. And we've recently deployed an extension that lets you put in um, structured documentation of templates and their parameters in the template page. And so we're going to be seeding some of those who are really popular templates, and we're hoping that um, the community will start documenting their templates this way, and then that documentation will automatically be picked up and used in this dialogue when... In fact, um, add, add, a, add a parameter called color. To start? Yeah. And then make it blue, which will look really bad. And now apply. <laughs> it's blue! So <laughs> what we did is we took... <laughs> We took the parameter, we set it, you know, it's being used. If you go to template um, start, you can show them what this looks like. Anyways, it's used in the content to set a CSS property. Actually, but, you know, to do this, to do it on the client, we actually had to go out to the server, get a new version of the whole template, come back and render it. But as you can see, it, it happens all in line. You can't really tell that that's going on. So, yeah, let's see the template. It should let me see the template here. Um, Yeah, this is all the documentation, and then, um, yeah, it's actually trans it's actually including the color parameter within like the style attribute of the table. So and this you can do horrendous things like this. Yeah, and it, like I said, this stuff's actually pretty common. So we had to we had to build a generic enough facility that people could use it in you know kind of a variety of ways. Uh, but but these same facilities we think will be useful in places like WordPress, uh, which has a lot of generated content through short codes and uh, other CMSs, other websites in general that some of the content is directly editable and some of it's not. So um, also touching on a little bit on what this technology, how, how we kind of do this, is that instead of giving the entire HTML document to the browser and letting it do its thing with it the way that the Wikia implementation did, uh, we actually have every single character and um, an item that you see on screen is in a giant array. And um, that's our data model. And we have a transactional um, like system of you know, changing, uh, mutating that array uh, from you know, one state to another, which is how we do undo and redo. And that's also once we um, start doing collaborative stuff, we'll be sending those transactions over the wire. And so you can see that this is just an enormous JavaScript array, it and since like, yeah, and it's, it's kind of like it, it's very it's very much like a H, uh, like a HTML token stream, but um, even though this is pretty memory intensive, especially when you consider like every character is an array element, um, it turns out that um, JavaScript uh, engines these days are really efficient, and arrays are um, implemented at a low enough level that we get away with this for the most part, and um, and it's extremely stable. 
because we're not having to guess what did the part or what did the browser do when they pressed enter and and are we okay with that and should we change something but instead we're in the driver's seat we're getting the we're getting the enter key and we're deciding this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it in all these different situations and we're applying a transaction and we're and then we can undo that transaction and so the so the whole data model is very stable because of this design and then at the end we can just take that data model ignoring whatever's rendered in the browser and we and we turn that you know over to the server and it and it converts it so the browser never gets its hands on our data model so it can't screw it up so if you do something does the, if you update your data model you get the enter key does the browser also update its view or do you then tell the browser how to do yes we we tell the browser what to do okay. yeah in so that the, case yes when we started playing with this at first we um we had on a very tight leash. We intercepted all events and handled them all ourselves and just re-rendered every time. And we've since relaxed it a bit where if you just type, so if I just go and, and type There's characters There's some here, things that we let, you, um, let the browser do. The yeah. browser, we, uh, we trust the browser to just render that. Yeah. If, there, if you haven't selected anything and you type J, we're like, okay, this is probably fine. And we just right. let the browser render it. And so we pick up on the key press, we let it happen, see what the browser did, and then, um, and then process that transaction. If you do more complex things, like try to remove content or press enter or other things the browser are known to screw up, we intercept it, figure out what should happen, prevent the default event, and then do it ourselves and re-render. And in that case of just with Jade itself and Serbs, um, do you also pick that up and modify the data model, or do you just like later notice that this thing changed? We notice later, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, and the way that that works is we, we pull and we hash what did the content look like before, and what does it look like now? So and the then we do a diff, and then we take that diff, and we generate a transaction, and then we process it, and then we say, don't bother updating, because we're already up to date, and then the data model and the viewer, that's in sync. It's a very awkward system, but it allows us to increase like the front-end performance. Sure. Um, so the, the reason that we have to do polling is because... It's like um, 200 you, milliseconds or something? Like 100 or 200, yeah. The reason that we have to do that is if you correct typos using spell check, um, there is no event whatsoever that tells you that it happened. And that's just um, one of many things that you That's can one do. of many things. There are, um, so there is a deprecated interface that gives you like DOM modified events or whatever it is, or DOM mutation events. And there is a new thing coming up that's called Mutation Observer that will allow you to do this. But right now, in the browsers that we're having to support, is sort of this evil transition, this awkward transition where one of them is deprecated but still in most browsers, and the other one is sort of appearing, and there are probably going to be browser versions that have neither. So we can't really use those. We, might, we may in the future. And to give you an idea of how short this leash is, if you are on the right side of a link, browsers vary on whether they will extend the link, whether they will um, make plain text, or whether they will make blue underlined text that's not linked. So, and you can guess which one does that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so what we had to do is when you're typing on the edge of a link, um, the first time you type, on edge of a link, we, uh, we take control and we make sure we insert a plain character. And then from then on out, you're a plain character, so it's OK. Um, and it, the odd thing is, is that links um, are the inconsistent bit, but actually all the browsers agree on when it's bold or italic to extend it. Uh, but, but links, they all sort of disagree. So, it, so it's a really, really tight leash. We let the browser do almost nothing on its own. Um, so yeah. Touchpad doesn't work. Just use it. There's a mouse. Oh, yes, there's a mouse. Um, a anyways. Okay. Down. Yeah. Farther down. Here we I go. I think we're going to show some specific demos. Yes. Of how Parsec um, works and stuff. I'm, yeah. So first, I'll show you just a little bit about what Parsoid is. So Parsoid is the Node.js parser service that um, the other team built. And they basically just, you know, uh, take wiki text and convert it to HTML so you can just submit stuff to them and they will give you this DOM back. And you can see it has these data parser attributes that have like ridiculous JSON blobs in them that have all the information that they need to uh, round trip it back. And then um, they also have an interface that allows you to tr translate DOM back to uh, weak text. Of course, if you give it the DOM that it gave you, it will just trip it back cleanly. But even if you um, give it new things that don't have that special data attribute, it will still know what to do with it. And all those weird attributes that it added, Visual Editor doesn't actually use those. Uh, we, we leave them alone. But the important thing is, is that Visual Editor very delicately preserves all attributes that it doesn't 
you know, it, that it doesn't know it should be messing with. So no matter what special kind of um, attributes are on your, on your uh, HTML content, uh, they'll always be preserved. Uh, so, uh, so it sort of doesn't matter what CMS or kind of crazy things you're doing with your content. Um, I, th I think kind of the bottom line is we're showing you that we've, we're solving for like the most complex case imaginable, uh, which is Wikipedia. And we believe that it's a robust enough solution because of that, that it, it will be easily used by almost everyone else. And we would love to hear about like some difficult situation if somebody's trying to integrate it and they have a, they have a problem that we haven't quite solved. Uh, All right, we, uh, we're running out of time. We have about eight more minutes. So we're going to cut the rest of them a short bit. We've done this bit already. So I'll just demonstrate images real quick. If yeah. you would be kind enough to not scroll that away while I'm looking at sure. it. Um, so this is an image. It, um, it has an, where is it actually in, in the page conceptually? It's probably over here somewhere. Um, it has a, a thing that allows you to select the whole thing at once, which means you actually have to superimpose another image on top of it or it doesn't work with in your Explorer. Um, you can click it, that selects it, and then I can, um, I can resize it. And it only allows you to resize it, um, preserving the dimensions. And then there is also a button that I can click that pops up a sub-editor that allows me to um, edit the caption of the image. And this is actually a full sort of sub-instance of visual editor within visual editor that allows you to, because the captions can contain rich content. And you, we, have, we have tried. You can totally have tables inside of captions. It's totally evil, but it can be done. And so um, <coughs> this will actually correctly put wiki text within the caption of the image. And then, let's see. And you're going to be able to drag and drop images soon, yes. but uh, we don't have that working yet for these block level images. Oh, yeah, there's a block um, level image on inline image. And I don't know if we have an inline demo. It's OK. So we uh, let's see. We did that. We did that. And then. Um, so we'll just show a little bit about the concept of annotated content um, very quickly. I think we did that already, didn't we? No, not really. Okay. We didn't really talk about links. So, and I think this is an important point. So oh, yeah. in HTML, you use tags for everything, both for structure and for formatting. Uh, things like bold and italic are what we consider to be like inline elements. Uh, same with links. Um, so in Visual Editor, we, we actually treat those types of things differently. So um, we do have like structural elements that kind of say this is the start and the end of a paragraph. But for things like bold, what we do instead is that instead of just storing a plain text character in the array, we store like an object that contains like the character and all of its formatting. And it allows us to paint formatting like linearly, rather than having to deal with all the complexities of um, rebuilding the structure and balancing trees. And uh, it, it makes it so you can just select arbitrary bits and um, apply any kind of formatting. This is how we do bold and italic and links. And you can even have data inside those. So it's not just like flipping a switch, but it can be like a, a whole data structure that's being applied across uh, across multiple characters, and it's stored pretty efficiently. Uh, but we, we think that this is especially interesting because um, although we haven't gone this way yet, the idea of taking a sentence and then adding some kind of meta information to it, adding layers of information, th this technology makes it like trivial to do that um, and to be able to visualize it because you could take what used to just be like a meta layer and it, now you can like render it blue or you know some kind of some kind of highlighting. So we're really excited to see what, what we can do next with, with, with other types of annotation. OK. And then and the um, final thing. Yeah. And so then there's also this metadata thing. So in meta tags, we almost always put them in the head. But you don't, you're not limited to that in HTML. And, and also, uh, Wikitext, people put categories like where, near where it references the, you know, it being Oops. part of that category. Um, it's not like really a great idea, but people do do it. So what we do, <laughs> like, like almost everything in Wikipedia. Um, so, uh, so what we had to do is we had to make it so um, we actually have like a secondary data model that is like a shadow of, of the main data model where we remember where meta items were. And even if you delete sections, we collapse them and things like that. So in Visual Editor, if you delete a paragraph but there was meta information inside that paragraph, we actually preserve the meta information. Um, right now, we think that that's the safest way to go. Uh, because you, as a user, weren't really able to make a deliberate choice to delete that information because you couldn't see it. 
Um, and it also gives us the ability to edit things in place. So if you go to the category editor, yep. maybe close the console real quick. Yeah, uh, how do I close it's it? It's on the left. Oh, because that makes sense. Yeah, quickly. OK. Um, so the first category in this list um, is in the middle of a paragraph, and the other one's nicely placed at the end. And even if you change the default sort key, which is like this weird thing that Wikipedia lets you do, um, this will um, not move it to the bottom of the page. It will, it will modify uh, it in place. So um, and we, we also can store anything that's in the page that you can't see uh, we store it as meta information as well. So like we're doing this with like meta tags and categories, but this could be done with like HTML comments or like anything that it, you normally wouldn't be able to see in the view, but it is indeed there and we can preserve its, its placement in the document through, uh, it can survive editing. And then uh, that's, that's our demo. That's it. So thank you. Questions. Yes. How does one obtain this and nah. deploy it and use it? Okay, so he's attempting to get to a slide that will have some URLs on it. Is it like GitHub? So we use a system called Garrett, uh, which is a pre-commit code review system. Uh, I mean, it's you know it's similar to uh, you know any other kind of Git repo, but when you when you submit a patch, it has to be reviewed before it's merged in. It's like using pull requests by force in uh, GitHub. So uh, we use that, and it's, uh, you can get an account on that. But if you go to mediawiki.org slash visual editor, there's a lot more information about our project, including how to get, obtain the source code. Um, once we're done releasing in a two weeks, we're going to be focusing more on making it easier for the third party use. We're going to have a distribution, maybe something you could pull down from a CDN. Um, and we're also going to be putting a lot more time into documentation. In the meantime, we're on IRC and we're happy to answer questions and get people started. It's in JavaScript? Yes, yeah. it's entirely in JavaScript. Uh, so it runs in the browser? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a, a WYSIWYG browser editor? Yeah, Visual Editor is, a, a, is okay. only a client-side system. Okay. And uh, the, the parser system we were talking about before, it runs in Node.js, but unless you're editing a wiki, you wouldn't need that. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of paired that with WordPress. You mentioned WordPress. Did I misunderstand you talking about this might have some things to run with Mediawiki? Yeah. I, I, I the question think was, does this allow me to integrate it with WordPress? Sorry, yes. Sorry. Um, in some fashion. In some fashion, yeah. So uh, I have not yet sat down and written the WordPress extension that integrates Visual Editor, but we are planning on doing that. Uh, and we believe especially that our ability to support generated content and edit parameterized content is going to really fundamentally change the way people work with WordPress because right now short codes being littered throughout your WordPress, if, if you've ever done serious WordPress work and you keep using short codes, it's, 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 you may as well be using markup. <laughs> you are, yeah. It would be a WordPress plugin that would replace the actual WordPress editor. We would obliterate their use of TinyMC. That's our hope. I'm hoping to do that this summer. I use WordPress a bit myself, and I, you know, out of personal interest, I want to at least hack it in. But I, I'm hoping that people in the WordPress community, once we kind of get it bootstrapped, can uh, pick it up. And the main reason why we MIT license this is because we want like a whole bunch of CMSs to be using this, so we can get more contributors. There's like 10 engineers working on this project, and um, I mean, you know, we're making good progress, but we need we need to have a large community to kind of sustain something that's complex. Yeah, you. Yeah. So the question was, is this in a stable version of MediaWiki? It is not a part of MediaWiki proper. It's an extension. It currently de depends on features that are only present in the alpha of MediaWiki right now. Right. Um, of course. Because, of course. Because we've basically been scrambling to try and get this live in Wikipedia in the next month or so. So it depends on all sorts of weird stuff. Um, you, can, uh, you can install it um, locally fairly easily. Um, there are instructions on that page right there on how to do it. You will, however, probably need to run uh, MediaWiki from more or less master. Yeah, I got you. And uh, get on IRC. If you're running a MediaWiki instance and you want to start using it, that's what we do. So we'd love to make sure you. I, I have helped nine of our 10 engineers set it up. So. Cool. All right, thanks. We'll let you guys go.
through oh. those initial set of slides. Do we have time? We have supposedly 15 minutes before the next set gets. Do you know what uh, slide it cut off at? I believe we've gotten through the flaming horns. <laughs> Maybe a slide or two beyond that. The flaming horns is critical. I know, I yeah. know. Um, that sucks. Yeah, it, we could do that if you want. That would be lovely. Yeah, so I think we've gotten, I think it was a can I use that slide sure. and maybe three beyond that. Yeah, because the, the horns are like, yeah, yeah. around that time. Okay. Bonus points for recognizing can I use. Yes. <laughs> Oh, you, you did indeed. You so for anyone it. who missed the beginning, you now get to see it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, awesome. But if people can stay down for the video camera, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, I'm Trevor Pascal, and this I'm is Ron Patel. And uh, we're working on a project. So our question is, you know, what is the deal with contributing content to the web? Uh, we've come a long way since GeoCities, but most of the content being contributed now is very simple. Uh, at least in GeoCities, you could put annoying images on. Now uh, you're pretty much limited to hashtags. Most people contribute to the to the web this way now, and it's it's kind of tragic that we are no longer allowing uh, most people to to work on like full documents. And so we think, you know, what what's the deal? How how can we possibly allow people to do this? And what technology would do that? And this technology has been around for a long time. But on the web, it's, it's been a struggle. And so there is actually a piece of technology that lets you do this. It's called Content Editable. It allows you to mark an HTML element as editable, and then the browser will just let you edit it. And it's actually fairly well supported these days. It's even supported in mobile there over on the right. But there is a caveat on this Can I Use page, which says, this support only refers to very basic editing capability implementations very significantly. And that is a gross understatement. Um, implementations vary a lot on how they do anything at all. Um, I know the guy that wrote the spec for this, or tried to write one. Um, it mostly revolved around standardizing what browsers already do. And there are seven pages about what should happen when the user, press, user presses enter. And so different browsers have slightly different ways of handling enter presses. And if it's a complex enough operation that requires seven pages of spec, that means there are significant differences in how it's implemented. And your DOM will just be trashed whenever the user presses enter. It's horrible. And that's why anytime anyone's doing any real web publishing, we always get them back to markup, whether it's markdown or editing HTML inside of a WordPress instance or editing wiki text on Wikipedia. And so what we want is an editor that lets you, that sort of like recognizes bits that it can deal with and sort of fences them off and lets you step around them and still renders them and shows them correctly but doesn't like edit them. So this way, you can support progressive enhancement. You can decide to support those things later and build support for them, and then they'll sort of like become unfenced and become editable. And the other thing that's missing is handling of parameterized content, where you might have something that's kind of like the result of a function call, where you can't edit the result directly, but you can see it. And you should be allowed to tweak the parameters and then see what those tweaks lead to in the rendering and be able to see those tweaks. Um, there are. Um, Web-based document editors out there that let you edit fairly complex documents. Um, unfortunately, none of them are open source. Google Docs is the most well-known one, and there are others that have done similar things. And they're not open source. They use proprietary formats, I think, although I think Google Docs uses LaTeX, but I'm not sure. And the worst thing is they are designed for print, like documents designed to be printed on paper. Which, that's not what we want. We want As things in dead trees. Dead trees, exactly. And that's not what we want. We want things through the web. We, we need something that speaks language of the web, which is HTML5, and that works in major browsers, but doesn't necessarily limit itself to the pitfalls of any given browser in the way that it decides to implement editing, as opposed to the four others, which, you know, especially these two are problematic. Um, and before you call me out and unfairly bash Internet Explorer here, Yes, it really is that bad. It is worse than you could possibly imagine. Um, we have a couple people that work on our, in our um, basically like on our content editable integration and on dealing with browser issues, and they spent like half their time on Internet Explorer issues, even though it's like only about 10% of our users. And um, it does a lot of things very differently, which is very annoying, and especially with content editable where there's a lot of gray area and unspecified stuff. The things they do are completely insane. 
Okay, now we're, now we're done redoing our intro. Thank you so much for listening to it twice. <laughs> We hopefully, yes, we hopefully do have the next slide on the recording, so. Yeah.